You're listening to How I Sell, a podcast built for early career sales professionals. You'll hear stories, best practices, and guidance from top sales leaders on what it takes to become a sales superstar. Today's episode is made possible by Ramped Careers. Ramped is on a mission to build the next generation of workforce-ready talent. Alright everybody, welcome back. Thanks for joining us today. Today we have a special guest. It's Mr. Tom Hanrahan of Square. Tom joins us currently as the head of US sales at Square, but he spent 15 years in sales, tech sales, sales operations, BD at companies like Amazon, Living Social, and obviously now now at Square. Uh, So Tom, for our guests who don't know you, Uh, Who is Tom (laughs) Hanrahan? I love it. Um, Well, thank you, Danny, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, You know, I'm I'm a simple man. No, it's uh, I've been in sales, gritting my teeth for 15 years, uh, was a marketing and finance major at a college, um, had dreams and aspirations of doing sports marketing for Nike and LeBron James. And it turns out um, LeBron only hires his friends. (laughs) <laughs> um, fell into sales after that, and, and the rest is history. I've been very fortunate to be at some great companies and be mentored by some phenomenal leaders. So, nice, nice, nice. That's awesome. Was, was LeBron a favorite growing up, or is that is that uh, so based on where you lived, or what, or what? Oh man, no, I, I think he's incredible. I'm a diehard Knicks fan, so I was joking with my colleagues uh, yesterday. The only thing I have to look forward to every year as a Knicks fan is the NBA draft because we're the worst team. <laughs> For the last 20 years, and I can only hope that we draft somebody as good as LeBron James and then sign him forever. But big fan of his game, but unfortunately, I'm a Knicks fan, and that's been brutal for majority nice. of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel your pain. I'm a Tim Rose fan, so it's, uh, it's pretty much the same story, right? You know, last night was like the peak. Last night was the NBA <laughs> draft for our listeners. The last night was like the peak of the season with uh, with uh, with the number one pick. So it's all downhill from here. <laughs> I hear you, man. Cool. So let's talk through some of your early career. So take us back. You know, you're about to graduate college. What were those years like? What were you like? Yeah. So dating myself a little bit, um, but 2008 is when I came out of school. And if you're not familiar with what 2008 was, it was the housing bubble and the market crash, all these things. And we were basically coming out of a recession. And I think what I was like is one, just really grateful to, to have a degree at that point. I was the first person in my family to, to have the privilege to, to go to university and get a four-year degree. Um, but I was a little lost. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I told you marketing was kind of my background and I flirted with, do I go to get my MBA right away? Are there marketing roles that even hire somebody at a college? Um, and then fortunately, I got involved with a company called Aramark. And if you're not familiar with Aramark or the Red Star, they do a ton of uh, stadium concessions. They also have a business line uh, for their uniform services division and didn't know much about the space other than they were uh, a top rated company um, that you know had a great background, a great sales training program. But more importantly, I had a really good friend of mine that brought me into that company. Um, and that was why I took that opportunity off the start in the beginning. Nice. And so when you were thinking about taking that opportunity and I I graduated in 09, so obviously the tail end of it, but, but same, same type of, same type of feeling where I was just lucky to have a job, you know, blessed to to be employed uh, when so many weren't Um, when, and I think I, I may know the answer, but did, did sales at that point choose you or did you choose sales? Oh man, that's, uh, I would be lying if I said I chose sales, right? And I think I've spent the first part of my career trying to force myself out of sales. So sales chose me and it was something that uh, the more I got involved with it, I, there were things that were really appealing. One, I loved coaching, developing and being able to connect with other human beings, whether that was a seller or you know a peer or in later in my career managing people. And then for me, I grew up, you know, really humble beginnings, didn't have a of a, a lot of money in the family growing up and there wasn't a ton there to fall back on. So the fact that whatever work I put in, you know, showed up on my paycheck was really appealing for me for a career. Yep. Awesome feeling. That first commission check that you get, you're like, wow, that's, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, um, so when you're thinking back to a point or points in your career, when you knew that it really clicked, when, when was that, when did sales click for you? 
Oh, man. I think for me, one, it, it was ego driven early on. So once I realized I could be good at this, right, and I could use charisma and my ability to read people and connect with individuals and make a living out of it, um, which was early on, I then got humbled along the way. Like ego, I thought I was good and I got humbled and we can jump into that. Um, but for me, it just, I think when, when I started to realize the caliber of people that I was around and not only just the, the intelligence and I've been fortunate to have a lot of great mentors I work with, but how much they care about people and um, developing people they work with, but then also um, the products they sell. You know, a lot of times when you're outside of sales, you think, you know, unfortunately, used car salesman. It's like, oh, it's this guy trying to get over on you. And it's quite the contrary. The best salespeople I've ever been around are people that really care about the challenges that maybe that business or individual is going through um, and then find a way to provide the best solution. Oftentimes working, you know, tirelessly internally to create that solution for that customer. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's when I broke that stereotype in my head and saw, oh, wow, this is there's some incredible people that I want to be that. And once I could visualize it, that's like, OK, this is the career I want to focus on. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It still exists today. When you say the word sales, still 2020, with all of the innovation, people still immediately think, you know, Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or used car salesperson. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that stigma still exists? Yeah, I mean, one, I think the media probably doesn't help <laughs> with a lot of that, right? You know, but um, it, it's also people just aren't educated and informed. And sales is a, it's a, it's a skill set that not a lot of people possess. So when there's things you can't explain, you don't possess, or you haven't educated yourself, you start to just make up your own perception of that, right? So that that's where I think people shy away from it. But what's funny about that, Denny, it's like, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I can't, I don't want to be in sales, but I'm an entrepreneur. Or oh, I can't imagine being in sales, but I want to be an, an executive one day. The best entrepreneurs, the best executives are all selling all of the time. So yeah. it's funny to me that it's like, you know, sales is not so much the career as it is a skill set that everybody should want to possess at some point in their career, regardless of the field they chose to pursue. So choose that's, to pursue. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. The leaders in our field, the leaders in tech, the leaders in any industry, they're all great salespeople. I mean, your, your CEO, Jack Dorsey, you know, Steve Jobs, they were all exceptional salespeople, regardless of how much they or others talk about how there's no sales at any of those companies. They're, you know, that they, they, they are the master of their craft and their craft is selling their product. Um, so in thinking back, you know, you mentioned before, but this theme comes up a lot. Uh, mentors or teachers in your career or folks who inspired you. Do you have a list of folks that you can think of that inspired you or mentored you in your early career? Oh, man, this is the game changer for me, right? That was the accelerator for, for the people I was fortunate to work with. And it's Raj Karana, if I'm going to name some people from Amazon, Eric Sager from the early square days, Mike Cassetta, my, my boss now, Ashley Greck. And what I'll tell you, you know, I was fortunate to work with them directly, but then the networks that have expanded outside of that and the mentors I've had that maybe aren't specifically in sales and, and they're in leadership positions have really helped me grow my career. Um, and for your audience, I would say, I was a kid that, you know, out of high school was the first person in my family to go to college, had to take out a lot of loans to pay for that, and then just grip my teeth in a really challenging sales role where I was, you know, signing five-year contracts, 200 cold calls a week, 30 in-person prospecting, you know, the salespeople that get this life, well, oh, wow, like, you know, they, they understand the metrics there. Um, and I struggled just asking for help. I struggled to look and find mentors because I didn't want to be an inconvenience. And I had an ego that said, no, I got to figure it out. Everything's on me. That is the worst thing you could do. People want to help. There's, you know, people that have been through this career and have found success. They know how difficult it is. So, you know, to me, the biggest accelerator in my career was having mentors and, and being willing to put myself out there and be vulnerable with them to learn and just learn from their experience so I could accelerate my own development. Yeah, that's, that's Tom, that's such good advice and something we try to teach at Ramps, but also isn't taken to heart enough. And that's be, you know, be open, be willing to accept feedback and potentially constructive criticism from those around you. And it'll only make you better. You don't have to do it alone, especially in sales, even though it's an individual, sometimes an individual game, uh, you're part of a team and the more the team grows, the bigger the pie is for everyone. So that's, that's, that's awesome advice. Uh, well, Take me through those challenges, right? Your, your early sales your early sales job, you're making all those cold calls. 
Um, walk me through what it was like to sell to senior decision makers in the early days. You know, were you apprehensive? How did you deal with it? What were you feeling? Yeah. Oh man, it's it, it's fond memories. But I mean, to paint the picture, I was the youngest person on my sales region by about twenty years. Right. Um, the customers that I would talk to, they would joke where you know they. One guy told me he was on a mechanic shop. He had coveralls older older than I was, and he was an older gentleman in this region. Um, I took offense to that, but we we made a joke. I don't know if I ever sold him our service, but it was challenging because every day you're struggling with imposter syndrome, right? And sales, it's like you come to a business or you come to the office. Excuse me. At the time, we were a field sales rep, so we come Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You have your big team kickoff. You check in Wednesday. You do a cold call session with everybody Friday. It's like you're writing contracts, and then it's up to you. So Tuesday and Thursday, I'm 22 years old. It's like, well, I can just do nothing and watch first take on ESPN, or I can get out there. And that was that was tough. And I'd be lying if I said every day I was going 100 miles a minute. There were a lot of mental challenges there, and I think um, I was fortunate to have a manager who would push me and drive me there. And and then I think what became fun is the same people that would dismiss me. I almost made like an internal game. It's like, oh, the guy who has a, the auto mechanic shop that said his coveralls are older than me. Great. I'm going to go find a way to get 10 of his friends and competitors and make that like an internal game. Oh, the person in the shop who was our delivery driver who maybe thought that I was like, you know, this young kid who didn't know what I was talking about. I'm going to go be the best salesperson, you know, in his region to make a point there. It became this fun like I just made like little challenges for each thing that, that was a hurdle. And then I started to thrive on that and feed off of it. And um, it kept me motivated through the, through the challenging times. Yeah. It's this, this again, uh, our audience should listen up because these internal games or these self kind of competitions, this is really a great way to challenge yourself and to motivate yourself when things are tough and it's going to be tough. You know, Tom, it sounds like that early sales job was, was grueling, frankly, uh, not, not everybody, uh, not everybody jumps into a, a sales job like that, but you, you got to keep yourself positive and optimistic and going. And it sounds like you've, you've figured out a way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say, Danny, just to add to that, they came at the right time. Like, I think you should always go focus on your, your first roles at a college and in sales, like f find a mission driven company that has the right leadership that you want to align with. But I just happened to find one that was really, really hard and it humbled me quickly. And I benefited from that in every other role I've been a part of. That's awesome. So it's a good segue to where we are going next. But, you know, as you approach leadership in your career, you know, you're an early manager. When did you know uh, you could lead a team to success? And, and what did what did that feel like when you were like, OK, I got, I got this management thing. Was it easy? No, um, I joke with some of like my managers now that are getting into it where, you know, the biggest mistake for first time managers make and I did the same thing is you think you're like the you can fix everything right and in either one or two things either it means that you overly commit to trying to help somebody who maybe doesn't have the the will to want to be in that position or you just do everything and you burn out and that's absolutely the trap I my first management role was at a uh, living social had a great environment there but high velocity high volume sales environment and you know, very transactional. So we're talking, bringing anywhere from 30 to 50 accounts a month, launching new products. Um, and it was tough, man. It, it would, I would show up to the office around 7.30 and then leave probably like six. And then I lived in Staten Island. If anybody's on the East Coast, I lived in Staten Island, but our office was in Union Square. I'd go to the gym after and I wouldn't get home till like 10 p.m. By the time you take a ferry and I do it all over again. And it was just, I, would, I was spinning my wheels because I didn't have a plan, but I knew I'd work hard. Right. So I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, like, when did it click? But I think that's when I knew I, want, I wanted to get better at it, but I really sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it, it's, it, it's like uh, it's bringing back like easily bringing back memories because I'm sure we're actually probably going to head to head as I was Groupon's <laughs> NYC manager in 2011. And oh. I remember, you know, one waking up every day, checking that living social deal and being like, God damn. <laughs> Yeah, how did they get how did they get that one uh and then you know i managed a team that was half inside half outside or a portion outside and and one of the reps was in uh staten island i actually flew out to staten island and cold called with her and like went around to restaurants in staten island so we probably like you know ships oh. crossing in the night at some point it's so funny 
It's such a small world. We could, yeah, we'd have to go back, look at some old Salesforce records. To, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh uh, man, uh, Living Social ran that. We got to get it now. <laughs> uh, uh, it's really good, really good. Um, so, and and okay, as you're as you're cruising along, and you know, the the first leadership job was was obviously humbling, but you know, did you focus on a specific type of leadership philosophy or style or is there one that you you know that resonates with you now yeah i, I think early on and this holds true even to like the position i'm in today and, and as i've grown my leadership career um there's a book i'd recommend and plug and a good friend of mine keith rosen coaching salespeople and the sales champions right and the concept it's a great read so add it on audio audiobook or um purchase it, you know on amazon and uh, it talks about closing the gap and the idea and the philosophy I have is like, listen, not everybody's going to go from zero to 100 overnight. And re in reality, progress and development is a bunch of knobs turned 1% of the way to the right. And if you do that enough, you then get this incremental spike in growth and, and, and skill. Um, and that's something took me a little bit of a while to learn, but I've tried to embrace with everybody I've worked with. It's like one, meet them where they're at, figure out, do a full analysis of, you know, what's their competency level, what's their will to be in the role, what, what are their gaps, what are their strengths? obsess over their strengths. Too many managers try to create somebody who is, you know, mediocre at everything, but great at nothing. And I'm, I think quite the opposite um, for development and then just keep coaching to the gap. And, and that's that's what I've, uh, that's been relevant for me from being a frontline manager of 10 people to now being in a position where I'm overseeing the, you know, the U.S. Nice. That's, that's awesome. And obviously, obviously it's working for you. And, and I think it's a great, it's a great management style too, because you get to see they and, and they can see it too right they can see this growth along this path instead of here's this end goal i have to meet it right away and in sales there's right. always a leaderboard so you have to like kind of battle that internal uh internal emotional craziness from an early rep that just wants to be the best but that you know they have to take a journey to the top um my question is when you're when you're faced with you know somebody early in their career that's potentially struggling with a key topic or you know cold calling how do you how do you coach that person up and coach that person to success yeah so i think you know in these conversations it's important to create space for like whatever's coming up for that individual that's okay like you know right out you know maybe you're being hard on yourself you think you know you suck at something or you don't know something or you're never going to get better feel in that space and then from there it's then starting to figure out, well, what are the specific things that we want to focus on? So expect, example would be, if I'm struggling with cold calling, well, what is it? What are all the components of cold calling? You have your targeting, you have your opening, right? You have like your follow-up cadence, your high-low activity, not to geek out on like the sales not side of it, but what's going into your, your 30 second commercial to your pitch? Who are you calling? What time are you calling? How many times are you reaching out? And then just like breaking out what are those, those um, you know, little knobs and then figuring out how we can just improve slightly and simplifying it. The best thing that early managers can do for your, you know, BDRs, AEs, SERs is simplify the gap and then just get that much better versus saying, well, you're 20% the target now. How are we going to make up the 80% gap? That doesn't work, right? So really figuring out what's coming up for that individual and then trying to simplify the, 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 the progression or the slight development that we need to see. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And how do you typically work with those junior folks? You know, our audience is typically folks coming right out of school or about to start their first role. How do you work with the BDRs and the SDRs of the world to make sure that they're on that track to success? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, for us, um, the square, we try to be very clear on just like, you know, things that skills and competencies that we want you to develop and then focus on as you grow your sales career. We also try to create a, a lot of space for um, just personal development, whether it's things that you want to do outside of the company and, and books and things like that, and allow you to bring that into conversation with senior leaders. Uh, but then it's also, I think there's a lot of tactical stuff that I can list out. The most important side of it is, is be a human, right? So the, anytime I get a chance to connect with, um, you know, people who are doing cold calling, which if you're a BDR, SDR, whatever you call it, if you're picking up calling business cold, hardest flipping job in sales. I don't care what any enterprise account executive tells you or a senior sales executive, whatever, being that role, the cold call role is the hardest role. But if you can do it, you got like an honor badge there and you can have a long career in sales. It's very productive and fruitful and lucrative. Um, so for me, Danny, it's really connecting with the people, connecting with the person, figuring out what they're motivated by. 
and then stress testing a little bit. Like, okay, do you want to do this? It's a little bit crazy to do this kind of work. And then just along the way, really watching their progression, checking in, and then supporting along the way. Nice, Tom. I, I love it. I'm smiling big because on all of our training materials for Ramp Careers, the first rule on everything, whether it's email sequence writing, cold calling, prospecting, finding a mentor, being professional in the workplace is be a human because you're, you're going to interact with other human beings uh, regardless of, of where you're at and what medium you reach them on. So I, I love, I love it. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, and then, you know, off of, off of that, you know, what, what are some of the key attributes you look for in early stage, early career salespeople when you're hiring? Is there, you know, is there a, uh, a couple factors? Is there traits, personality quirk? Is there something you look for across the board? Yeah, yeah. We really pride ourselves on grabbing great people and then teaching them how to sell our product, right? And I think those are the best. And I think that's a lot of what your company is doing, right? Get good people and we'll teach you how to do this, which is such a huge value add. Companies like this didn't exist. Um, the things that I really break down when I'm bringing somebody into the team or anybody I, I'm excited to work with, one, you got to be coachable. If you come in with a ceiling that's predetermined, we can't work together because I will bring, let you give a lot of feedback, but you got to receive too. So there's got to be this coachable um, side of it so you can learn and your ceiling is, is infinite. Um, two, you got to be motivated. Can't want something for you more than you want for yourself. And if you play that game of, you know, um, defeating yourself and, and being unmotivated and being lackadaisical and apathetic, this is not the career for you, right? A lot of other things you can do. Um, three is hardworking. I would, I'm making this number up. There's no data to, there's no historical data to support it, but I believe 80% of a sales job can be accomplished if you just work hard, right? Like if you just grit your teeth, make the dials, embrace the sales science, you will get better over time. And then the fourth is competitive. Like, so there's motivation is like, hey, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to work and I'm going to do the job. And um, there's something driving me. Competitive is I'm driven to be the best, right? And that's, and the best could be defined, determined, or excuse me, defined as, better than you are today and that's okay doesn't mean best of a leaderboard but you want to be the best version of yourself and that's what we look for um with people who who are competitive yeah those are those are great uh and and kind of off that you know the best sometimes it runs into attitudes where you want to be the best at the expense of others how do you curb that on a sales team because we we, we encounter that a bit where somebody just so driven competitive and it's a great thing it's really great but they just, yeah. you know, their focus is on others instead of making themselves better. How do you, how do you curb that when you run into it? And I'd say it's a trap, right? And I'm sure you see it all the time and, and you have in your career. It's um, what's mindset. Like we go back to reset the mindset, right? So there's two types of toxic sales individuals. One, those that you're describing who become apathetic and blame every other scenario for them not being successful. And then two is those who like have only care about themselves and leave bodies behind. Both of those are a huge risk to our business and any business I've been a part of. So it's really sitting them down and making sure they have the right mindset to where if you're an individual who's leaving bodies behind, hey, what's the impact of that toxic, you know, um, you know, attitude that you're having there? What's the impact of the team and putting team first, right? Um, if you're somebody who is looks at every other reason why you're not successful, um, that's a that's a tougher conversation because that that really boils down to do you have a victim mindset or a growth mindset? And there's one thing I guarantee it will hold true today. It's hold true the last hundred years and it will hold true the next hundred years. If you're somebody who has a victim mindset, which means I can't do this because of X or because of Y, it's not something you control, you will never be successful at sales. And that is guaranteed. I would argue you wouldn't be successful at most things, but definitely not sales. Yeah. Yep. 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 Great, great advice. Great advice. And uh, something that, you know, our audience, uh, for, for y'all listening, you know, take this to heart, right? You can be driven, you can be competitive with yourself, even with others to an extent, but just don't let it creep into that, you know, that toxicity, that, that zone where it's going to impact others negatively. And I think you, you laid that out really eloquently, Tom. And uh, two more questions before I get you out of yeah. here. Um, one is, you know, we, we talk with a bunch of, uh, we, we talk with several early stage or about to jump into their you know, their first sales role types of folks. And they're, they're curious, you know, uh, the what if game they play with themselves is, you know, what, what are some, what are some things I can avoid? What are some things where I, you know, I should, should not do either in an interview or as the, you know, the early stages of their first job, you know, what are some of those missteps you see early stage uh, salespeople fall into and, and how do they remedy them right away? 
Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I think one big red flag, don't ever badmouth your company. Even I will bait people into it. If you start down a path of, I didn't like X, I will ask you third, second, third, fourth level questions to make you talk about it. Don't do that. It's, it's, it's unbecoming. Um, two is, I think sometimes people lack death in, in, their, in, their, in their answers. And it's challenging when you don't have professional experience. But if you're, you know, it's your first job, pull in some of those things that have been like impressive accomplishments in your life, whether it was, you know, um, going to college or something to do with like maybe a sports team that you uh, played on or first job. Those are really compelling and telling of somebody's character and their ability to achieve something. And oftentimes I think newer employees or fresh out of college stay away from that because they don't know how to have that conversation. I think it's irrelevant. It really isn't. What we're looking for are people with high character who are excited to take on new challenges and problems. And sometimes uh, that, that doesn't come up as much for people that don't have the professional experience. Yep. Yep. That's, that's great advice. Really, really great advice. So last question is something we ask uh, every, every guest we have on our podcast. Uh, you know, with the benefit of, of hindsight, if you could go back in time, uh, knowing what you know now, what piece of advice would you give yourself coming right out of school as you're about to embark on that first sales job? Mm. Uh, I think the number one thing would be to be patient. The salespeople, almost by definition, are going to be achievers. Competitive, I talked about that as a characteristic earlier, and just put so much urgency on whatever goal you have in front of you. Um, and at times, that leads to being impatient, and that leads to bad decision making. So it could mean leaving a company prematurely or um, move into another role because you think it might be easier or it's a, uh, so we have a lot of people who move back to sales, but go to product because that's a cool thing to put in your LinkedIn. And what I'm getting at is be patient with yourself, really have the conversation and what I would tell myself of what my values are, what I care about as a person and as a future leader, and then be patient and then just trust the process. Nice, nice. Very wise. Uh, obviously comes from from tons of experience and you know it is it is difficult in sales to, to have that awareness to just sit yourself down and be like okay it's okay to just be on this path and this role for right now um, Tom it's it's been a real pleasure thank you so much for your time uh, there's tons of knowledge for our audience that they're gonna eat this one up uh, and you know we would love to uh, revisit this conversation a couple months or a year down the line and check in with you and see how everything's going and, and join you again on, uh, on another podcast. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And for those of you that are watching, um, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. Always happy to have a virtual conversation in this world and um, best of luck in whatever career you're pursuing and uh, best of luck for the people that are uh, pursuing career in sales. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tom. Have a great one.